Hello and welcome to this special episode of the Foot Weekly Podcast because we have some FC25 news, quite a bit of FC25 news actually, uh, so looking forward to bringing that all to you and I'm joined by a couple of guests who have already got hands on with FC25 or at least a very early build. First of all, we have uh, James. Hello, James. Hello, Ben. Good to have you and we have Nate, the Foot Accountant. Hello, Nate. Howdy, Ben. It's great to be back on and excited to talk about the upcoming. Yeah, it is. Only the second year, of course, of FC. And, you know, there are some significant changes. There are some nice community focus changes as well we'll get to. Uh, but there are two big headline things that are coming to FC. The first is Rush and the second is IQ, both of which will have a big impact on Ultimate Team. On this podcast, we'll go into some depth, but not too much, just to get a sort of overview on how these changes are impacting Ultimate Team. So let's start actually with Rush because it is quite a lot of fun. For those who don't know, it's a new social focused Ultimate Team mode. It exists in every mode, though in the game in various different ways. The idea is that it's a 5v5 and it uses regular gameplay mechanics and it's not really very much like Volta. You'll be in a team where it's you, three friends, or maybe randoms if you're doing sort of drop-ins, plus an AI-controlled goalkeeper. Each human is going to control one player, and you play in events which will restrict the pool of players you can use from your club. So it might be like max 88 rated, for example. And you draft players you'll be using before you go into the game. So before each match, you'll select a player from your club to take into the mode, and so will your teammates. Uh, you'll benefit from sort of a rewards multiplier to get more progress towards rewards if you hit certain squad building criteria. In terms of how the gameplay works, it is a bit different, although it does use the same sort of core gameplay mechanics. Uh, there are no fixed or even suggested positions. You can control the keeper if you're the captain, like you can if you're playing Ultimate Team normally, but it is an AI keeper if you're not sort of telling them to charge out or something like that. Uh, the pitch size is about 65%-ish of the full pitch, so it's actually a decent size. You can get a good amount of space. And there are some tweaks to the rules. So there are blue cards, which are like sin bins. Um, there's a race to the ball instead of kickoff, so you'll rush to the ball. Penalties are sort of a 1v1 from the halfway line versus the keeper. You've probably seen that in those old MLS penalty shootouts that they used to have. Yeah. And because of the sort of condensed nature of the game, they've made it so you could only be offside in the final third of the pitch. So that's hopefully a decent explainer of how it works. I know, Japes, you've actually not played this with other people, whereas both Nate and I have had the opportunity to do that. Are there any sort of questions you have about how it works or anything that uh, isn't clear to you or questions about the integration into Ultimate Team or anything like that? Well, one, thanks for making fun of me for not getting to play with friends. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Yeah. I, you know, I thought we were all a little bit of a family here on this podcast, but now I know differently. So that's to be aware of. I think the, the question from like a pure gameplay standpoint, I'm like, oh gosh, who's hosting this? Like, mm. uh, how how are we connecting? How's that going to work? I think that's kind of one of the, is everybody on individual ping to like a champ style server or, you know, I don't know. I, I Are you going to get matched up with randoms that are about your skill level? Like, mm. how's, how's, how's that going to play? But I think for, for me, you know, the question we're all going to have is like, what happens when someone drops? Actually, I have a little experience in that because when we were playing at the event, we actually had, for some reason, like, you know, somebody disconnected as a part of the team. And it just continued like a pro clubs game where, you know, I'm not actually controlling the player. And it's kind of just makes that one in-game player AI controlled. Their player kept playing. They just weren't controlling them because they disconnected. Let me, let me get this question out of the way first then. Is it fun? Oh, heck yeah. thousand percent, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. It's just, and it, feels, it feels fast. Yeah, really fast. It does feel fast. Yeah. It does. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, gameplay-wise, it's a shrunk-down pro clubs. And to be fair, the connection's all right if you're in the right region. With ultimate team players. Yeah. Like, I can't, you know, first blush, obviously. I can't wait. The idea of being able to, like, control icons or heroes in, like, a team of 5v5 playing with, like, five icons or heroes with the homies it sounds so fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it really is. I think, you know, there's a big lack 
of social play with an ultimate team and this is the thing they're aiming for is to make Yeah, you can blame other people when you lose. That's what that's what FC has been missing for years. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean it does just take the edge off, doesn't it? When you're in a voice call with people you know and something silly happens, some bug or something like that, it, it becomes funny rather than frustrating I think to some extent. Obviously it's still frustrating, but less so. And the idea that you can go in potentially with some of your favorite players depending on the event requirements, we'll get into that in a sec and just have fun with a group of friends, earn rewards, and also maybe there is a bit of a competitive edge to it. I think the concerns are really around drop-ins, especially because there isn't really any kind of suggestion of where you should be playing. And I wonder, Nate, whether that was something that you saw as a bit of a problem when you were playing, how people selected positions. Yeah, I'm probably going to think that like the player that you add into the squad, that'll be a little bit of that. Like, mm. oh, I'm going to add in Jude Bellingham, so I'm going to play in the midfield. Or, oh, I'm going to add in my Virgil van Dijk, so I'm going to play kind of a defender role. But it is, like, when you're set up to play and you start, especially off of kickoff, like, there's no positions. It's just you're lined up in a line and the ball's in the middle, and then you just go from there. So really, all the tactics are kind of just on you as the team to discuss and to work through who's going to go forward, who's going to come back. Do we want to have a quote unquote formation? How do we want to attack sort of thing? All right. Time yeah. out then. How does how how are we doing communication then for online? Right? Like that sounds like heavy communication is needed. Mm -hmm. And like if people aren't mic'd up. I think they mentioned something about that, but I don't there are like remember. Sort of D-pad type call outs yeah. you can do. So, you know, could, all right, so Rocket League. Play the pass or we got Rocket League. Drop back. Yes, yeah, like, exactly. like Rocket League. Yeah, exactly. So you've got that system. It's not super advanced. There are probably ways they could improve it, but obviously, you know, first year of this mode. So uh, maybe that'll be something that they work on for the future. And, you know, if you're in a voice call, obviously it's all fine. I don't think this is going to be something that you absolutely have to play. You know, it's not going to be something where if you didn't play it, you're going to be completely left behind. But I think it'll be something where you get rewarded for quite considerably if you're willing to do it for the time commitment you're making, if that makes sense. Because what would, at least in my mind, be the logical way to set it out is, right, we'll get people together, I don't know, on this particular day when the new event comes out mm -hmm. to play with their friends and they'll be well rewarded for that time they've spent. But after that, the rest of the week, they'll go on and play other modes. So there's that sort of focused time that people put in with their friends to play this mode, and then they move away and do other things. I mean, it's probably quite smart from EA's perspective if they can use this mode to keep pulling back in users who might have otherwise gone away, but their friends like, you know, well, come play with me because I want to do my uh, rush event and, sure. and get my rewards, then actually you might get people coming back into the mode who would have otherwise drifted away. So it could work quite well in that sense. Can you can you pick players from somebody else's club? No, it's just from your own club, yeah. Yeah. I did ask though, because I wanted to double check. I asked if you could do tradable and untradable, and they said yes. So technically, if you have a lot of coins, you can go buy whoever fits the event you know, requirements from the market. If it's like you need an inform or a special version of a player who's better than the rest, then you can still do that, but... Um, yeah, my man's already thinking yeah. of his trading potential. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I'm excited for too in, inside of this is like the events, which to try to draw a comparison to what that might be like would be just like the friendlies that we've had in the past, how they have certain requirements. So it'd be like, oh, you can only use a player from La Liga mm -hmm. and maybe 88 rated at the very beginning of the game, kind of like you mentioned. So... Just stuff like that that give a little bit of a twist to it as well so that you're not only using your top tier meta players from your main team and whoever you can best like supply to the team. But that's also part of the strategy too because like your one friend maybe has Mbappe and you've got like no good attackers but you have a good midfielder so you can like, oh, I'll use my Valverde. You use your Mbappe. We can create this team. So that's kind of part of it too from a building your team perspective. Okay, so uh, maybe I'm a little confused about the structure then, like how this how this works or how the what the progression looks like. Yeah, let me just go through how it is going to work in Ultimate Team then, because as I said, it is in other modes. So Jake's played it by himself because he played it in kickoff, but you can't actually play it in Ultimate Team without three other real people to play as your teammates, whether you find those through drop-ins or they're your friends or a mix of both. 
you'll find those teammates and you'll party up essentially to go and search within an event and the event will have a requirement on it. So it might be like max 88 rated players, although there could be one which is no requirements, I suppose. And then once you go in there, you'll as a team draft the players you're going to use and there'll be sort of squad requirements there for you to hit. And if you hit those requirements, it might be like striker, France, etc., you'll get a boost to the points you earn within the mode. So there is not an obligation to hit those requirements there, but it will help you out to earn more rewards. And then they've not been too explicit about how the rewards are going to work at this point, but it seems like it's going to be a system whereby you earn a certain number of points within the mode and that will unlock you increased rewards as you get through the different numbers of points required to unlock those rewards and they'll probably be like packs and stuff like that as you'd expect so hopefully that makes sense uh yeah yeah i think so so we're like friendly objectives that you just sort of like progress on yeah but not based on like wins necessarily yeah not necessarily wins i think you'll still get points towards those rewards even if you don't win and you'll get more points if you win and if you meet those sort of squad building requirements. Well, not requirements, I guess, because they aren't required. But uh, hopefully that makes some sense. The integration with Ultimate Team hasn't really been fully mapped out for the public. So we'll find out more, I guess, as time goes on. And on that note, we'll take a break and we'll be back to talk about a huge quality of life upgrade coming to Ultimate Team in 25, just after this break. Hello, welcome back right after the break. So Nate, can you guess what it is I'm referring to here? Would it have something to do with duplicates? It would, yes. So we finally have duplicate storage. You can store up to 100 duplicates, basically like a transfer list. And you can drop those directly from that duplicate storage list into your SBCs. So I guess, Nate, just a very simple, this is a really good thing. It's good it's finally happened. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how it works logistically in the menus because the way they explained it was, let's say you have like four or five duplicates, you know, like you open player picks or whatever, and you've got like a duplicate 86 rated car that you got from an 82 plus player pick and you're like ah oh, crap well i gotta go do an sbc now well with this you would be able to just like you do when you send somebody who's tradable to your transfer list basically just like slide them up and they go into the duplicate storage list which is a hundred spaces but also does not it's not the same as your regular tradable transfer list so it sounds like there's like 200 spaces for storage you'll have 100 for your tradable transfer list like normal and then 100 for your untradable duplicates and yeah like you said I, I think one of the best parts is i think it's sorted by recent so if you go from there into an sbc after putting somebody in your dupe storage those players will show up when you go into the sbc searchable like right away mm. i think that's really cool yeah it is going to be a huge quality of life upgrade and uh, from that, we move on to something which will also be a big upgrade, and that's an expansion for evolutions. Uh, one of the things they admitted was that the requirements were often too strict, and they're going to have a new upgrading system which will dramatically increase the number of eligible players. They haven't gone into specifics, but it certainly sounds promising. They also say they've solved a huge technical challenge. That was the words they used, a huge technical challenge, which means they can now evolve seven times more players. At the same time? Well, <laughs> that's not really what they said. And in fact, this whole section was a little bit vague, so I guess we'll find out more in time. I think they maybe mean that the volume of players that they can allow to be upgraded on their end is basically increased. But yeah, it'd be good to see something around that. We know it's technically possible because there was a glitch where it did work. So hopefully that'll happen too, but we'll see. Um, they also agree with the feedback that evolution items have become quite meh in terms of the visual design. And there's going to be a load more visual customization, including adding animations, color changes, and more. Almost like it looks like Nate layers over the, the item design or something. Yeah, there was a couple ones that they showed us that were like, you could choose the color, like you mentioned, um, like a set design, and then you can either choose like blue or red or green. But then also there was one design that they flashed over the screen that was like, 
animated with sound and fireworks like mm. on the card and that was like okay I, that's cool so hopefully yeah. that's in like all different cards throughout the year not just evos but yeah i think those evo things are pretty nice quality of life um updates and they didn't mention about doing multiple evos at once but i know that's what everybody was talking about that we, we would love to see that yeah it's a shame it would be really good hopefully that's something they can do and interested to know what the detail is around these things that they've said All right let's move on to competitive mode changes so rivals is what they've been focusing on for changes really here uh, so friendlies matchmaking will no longer use rivals matchmaking so the focus in those Friendlies will be objectives and having fun, although yeah, that's still probably quite questionable whether a mode which is for completing objectives is ever going to be super fun in my view, but we, we can find out. And then relegation will actually be possible in Rivals, but only from Divisions 1 and 2. And the combination of the two things is quite interesting because I guess it means, first of all, actually you won't be able to what people call smurf significantly, so really reduce your... Uh, division uh, in rivals because it's you know limited to a few divisions but also even if you were to do that it wouldn't affect friendlies anyway so actually the reason people were doing it quite often wouldn't necessarily be there anymore because it wouldn't affect that friendlies matchmaking um, the other thing they're doing is reducing the number of checkpoints so there's less getting stuck um, in certain places and you'll move down and play players more on your level and uh, that means that you're more likely to be where you deserve to be, as they described it. And therefore, the rewards in sort of Division 1 and 2, uh, I guess Elite as well, can actually be much better. Uh, there's more reward differentiation as well to motivate people to play in a higher division. Mm -hmm. Also, reward progress in Rivals has been changed. So it's three points for a win and one point for a draw, which means finally draws aren't kind of meaningless and you'll get some progress yes. for a draw, which is really good. So, yeah, Jake, any thoughts on, on those things? Uh, you know, I think we talked about it previously, like what would you do with rivals? And we were kind of like, mm. I don't know, like probably not too much, but all these are good tweaks. Like it's just, it should be a quality of life improvement. And I think this is a, it's a smart step in terms of not making drastic wholesale changes to it and seeing, you know, ultimately how this shakes out a little more. Yeah, Nate, I'd be interested to hear from you on this because I think it seems very positive, but ultimately, you know, it all depends how they kind of structure the rewards to some extent, I think, because that really changes people's motivation to play and how kind of true to what they want it to be the mode is, in a way. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, this is still going to be a competitive game mode that's probably going to give you some of your most sweaty, you know, mm. opposition and gameplay. But I think they're also realizing that and saying okay we want to make the rewards a bit different so they're trying to space those out and give better stuff to the top tier players to make you want to advance i think the points change for how you level up with the three points for a win and one point for a draw i think that's that's good because man i can't tell you how many times i drew in a division rivals game and i just felt like i wasted 20 minutes mm. <laughs> so i'm glad that that is in and then also just the friendlies matchmaking no longer linked to rivals I think that's maybe a little bit of an insight into the rush mode too. And maybe rush won't be linked to your skill level at all because the whole point of that mode is to be fun, right? Mm. And to just enjoy playing the game in a different way, kind of like how they're mentioning here with friendlies. So I wonder as well if rush is not going to be linked. I hope that it's not, to be honest, because I think that would help it out yeah. um, to be more free-flowing and fun. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing as well in Rush because you obviously have multiple players with potentially different abilities playing at the same time. So how do you actually... Right, trying like, to figure that out. Yeah, work yeah. That out. It'd, it'd be interesting to see if they do have a system for matchmaking there at all and, and what it entails. Again, there's a lot of information, I guess, we, we still don't know at this stage, including, of course, that ultimate team content pitch note, which we see quite close to the start of the cycle, which gives us a lot of insight into what EA are planning for the new game uh, in terms of content, which is pretty big. Yeah. Now, there was one thing on Rivals I forgot to mention, which is potentially an indication of how serious EA are taking this particular community concern, but clearly they're not able to do as much as they'd like. Uh, that is that in Rivals, they're going to be adding that point for a draw, and when your opponent quits on a draw, you are actually going to get a point which isn't something that they have done before. Previously, a quit on a draw would just count as nothing. 
hopefully that's something they can expand beyond just that we'll see now the other things that are coming for ultimate team that are a bit less significant perhaps although one of them could be is a new foot stadium which has an away section a bit of customization even when you're playing away and then a combined season pass which gives you progress and rewards when you play in pro clubs and when you play an ultimate team it's replacing the ultimate team season pass but it's giving you both rewards in ultimate team and in pro clubs so that sounds pretty good is there anything you wanted to cover before we move on to the tactics revamp nate yeah i think the whole point of the like season pass just to dwell on that a little bit more is like a lot of people have said well, I can't stop playing ultimate team because I'll lose, you know, I'll, I'll go behind and I'll fall behind if I'm not playing that. So I can't play pro clubs or I can't play career mode, but this is kind of like uh, bridging the gap so that if you want to play clubs, you can still earn XP and get through the season so that you can obtain maybe even an ultimate team card inside of the season pass, even while you're playing clubs type of thing. Yeah, it's funny actually, as someone who doesn't really like to go out my way to complete objectives for xp the idea of just being able to go into clubs and play clubs to get xp is very appealing and being able to make progress in ultimate team for rewards there and also to build up some xp for clubs which you know i wouldn't play so much so wouldn't unlock as much there i guess the only thing is will rush now scratch that pro clubs itch so actually maybe not so useful as it would have been in the past but we'll have to see and on that we'll take another break we'll be back to talk about the complete tactics revamp we're getting in 25 and i should say uh, it's worth reminding everyone at this point that all of this stuff is still somewhat in development so things can change but a lot of it i'm sure if not all of it won't change right let's take a break and we'll be back to talk tactics in just a moment hello supporters if you'd like this podcast directly into your podcast providing apps feed then there's a link in the description which will explain how to do that if you haven't worked it out already it's very handy and there's also a link for those of you who might want to join the discord if you're a gold or above supporter you have access and you can jump in there get involved with the conversation there's a champs channel for commiserating about your champs progress there's an evolutions channel for sharing evolutions there's loads of stuff in there loads of resources fantastic community and uh yeah i mean if you're not a gold tier supporter of course you could upgrade to gold tier and jump in there i'll see you in there if you do and yeah let's get back into the podcast but do check out those links if you'd like to Hello, welcome back after the break. Right, let's talk gameplay. There are a lot of gameplay changes, as you'd expect. And as I said at the start, we're not going to dwell on the gameplay changes too much because we'll cover them in more depth in the future. But the biggest thing for the gameplay team, alongside developing Rush, actually, is IQ, which is basically a revamp to the tactics side of the game. And uh, it's quite complicated to get to grips with even through sort of a visual presentation. Uh, can try our best here to do it in a sort of audio format, but realistically, I think people are only going to truly get it once they get to grips with it and start going through the menus and things. So let's start, and I'll just run through top level what this is. So it's a new tactic system, as I said, and there are three key elements to this. First of all, a revamp to team tactics, and that's things like depth, build-up, uh, the sliders, as people called it, I guess, within the tactics menu. And then the second thing is player roles. These are sort of instructions 2.0, I want to say. And then you've got smart tactics, which are the sort of on-the-fly adjustments you can make in the game. You're thinking about kind of D-pad tactic type stuff that you would have done in a match. So let's start off with team tactics. So you've got your formation, which is pretty much how you'd expect. There are some tweaks to the positions in certain formations and the formations available. They've changed that a little bit, but it's pretty much, as I said, as you'd imagine. And then you've got build-up style, which again is pretty similar to the, the tactics we have, but there are some kind of notable differences. They've simplified it quite a bit. So with build-up style, you can only choose between counter, balanced, or short passing. And then for the defensive approach, as they call it, you've got a slider which basically changes how deep your team defends and how aggressively they're going to press. So, Japes is someone who's obviously well into the tactics. 
is the sort of simplification of it, which I think is fair to say this has been kind of simplified, a concern or... Um, proof is in the pudding, maybe? Proof, yeah, proof's in the pudding. I know there are other aspects too that we have to, that are seemingly more, mm. a little bit more like player specific that I think could have larger impact. So I'm kind of trying to just take like a wait and see approach. Yeah, if they'd just done this, I think it would be a concern. It would be a bit of a shame. But because of this new player roles expansion, it does make more sense that they've simplified that element, I think. So the player roles, they are essentially, I guess in some ways, replacing work rates and instructions, which have been mm. completely removed. Roles primarily dictate player movement off the ball, mainly in attack, but they do also affect defensive intensity. So roles are much more specific and impactful and complex than instructions with much clearer kind of positives and negatives to setting these roles. And here's what you'll need to consider when putting a player in their correct position, which is kind of important because that affects whether they're actually be able to play to the role that you're asking them to do. So when you put them in your squad, this is what you have to think about, basically. The role you want them to perform, so you'll be able to set this, and it depends on the position they're playing in. So a left back, they could be a uh, fullback, which is kind of as you'd imagine it. They could be a wing back, or they could be a false back. And that's going to affect their behavior in terms of their positioning. And then you've also got a focus, which is kind of another layer to it. And you can also set this. And those options change depending on that role. So a false back, for example, you'd have defend. And when you're going forward, they would then play as sort of a, a defensive midfielder. Or you can have balanced, and they'll play higher up the pitch in sort of a central midfielder type role. So you've got both a role, which is kind of the role you want them to play, and then you've got a focus, which dictates, I guess, how defensive they're going to position themselves when they're going forward and also affects their kind of recovery speed and how intensely they're going to defend as well. And then you've got role familiarity. So let's take Zinchenko, for example. He might have a false back plus plus role familiarity, which means he will position himself exceptionally well basically when he's playing that false back role every player in the game will have a role plus but not many will have a plus plus so just to summarize this whole thing you've got the role which is essentially an instruction 2.0 much more variation and you have familiarity which is how well the player is going to position themselves when put into that role plus plus being the best and then you've got plus and then you've got regular which if you play someone in the correct position they will have the regular familiarity with every role in their correct position. And then you've got basic, which is when a player's out of position, they will be pretty bad positionally. And then you have the focus, which is really just to set a focus within that role. So it might be defend, it might be balanced, it might be attack. It depends on the position and the role, what that focus can be. Right, hopefully that all makes sense, Nate, as someone who's not really, I guess, so into tactics. What do you make of this? The thing that excites me about all of this is how customizable it is and the roles too. Basically, all of the instructions before when you were doing custom tactics in the old FC game and, and old FIFA games was like, you can control the team in terms of the tactics, like their defensive line and just the overall how you want the team to react you know, like there's the balanced and there's the uh, long ball or whatever, like type of build up play. But this is like you are controlling specifically each individual player, how you want them to react with the ball mm. in your instructions. And it's like there's four million different tactic combinations that you can have with all the different squads, all the different roles. There's, uh, there's just so many combinations and I love how in the game, how it's actually visually represented as well, because it'll show you kind of like your squad and your formation and it, you can like, the player will move. Like if you put Zinchenko, like you um, mentioned as a false back, he kind of like comes into the midfield a bit more thinking of like Spurs and how their um, left back and right back kind of get forward in the midfield and help out the attack. So it's, you can actually see them in game in your formation tactics going into the midfield and it'll show you that and it'll, it'll tell you like okay you might be more susceptible to wing play because your you know left backs are coming into the midfield but like it feels like almost you can create your own formation mm -hmm. and your own style of play 
with the ball and without the ball. Like I want to mention that because like that's so are there no formations? There are. You start with a base formation, but yeah. you can just like customize it so how much. many base formations are there? A similar number. It's not hugely changed. I think the key thing to think about though, and the big difference people will I think realize is your defensive shape is really your starting formation. Yeah. And then the player roles and the player focus that you set is your attacking shape. And so gone are the days basically of you being able to kind of set up a 3-4-1-2 or one of the, those formations in a back four when you defend. Mm -hmm. You could recreate though the attacking shape of you know a 3-4-1-2 by having your left back as the most attacking fullback role you can and having your right back on fullback defend because then they'll stay hmm. defensive or I guess you could have them as a false back defend kind of come into the midfield a bit more so you'll still be able to kind of create I guess similar shapes to some extent but the defensive shape really is dictated by your starting formation now which is nice considering some of the abusable ways people have used the tactics as they are currently to create certain defensive shapes and certain attacking shapes and there's much more punishment I think for players who are getting forward and getting really high they just won't defend with you know quite the same intensity that they used to because it's no longer just dictated by work rates like it was before mm -hmm. always with these things i think my head goes to like concerns less so than questions i'm like is everybody like is 442 going to be, still be broken defensively cuz then you know mm. you're just going to see like people set up in that i guess it i guess it creates a lot of room for nuance um and you're really going to be I think from a market standpoint, Nate, especially certain players with certain roles mm -hmm. are going to be like really, really desirable. Yeah. Mm. And they mentioned that actually in some of the presentations, they said that, you know, a Jude Bellingham gold card may have a, a different role plus plus than what a promo card of him has, you know, based on how he played in that game. And he got an inform for, you know, doing whatever, and he played a certain way, so he gets a different role plus plus. So his card will, in game, have more options and different options to attack, and maybe end up being better for certain positions. So yeah, those roles, I, I wouldn't say they're on the same level as like a play style, but it's kind of like a secondary metric, impact, impacting how the player is going to perform in game. So I, I think it will impact the market. For sure, that'll be another thing that we have to look at with these cards is like, okay, what play styles do they have? Oh, but what roles do they have too? Because that'll change based on the version of the card that is released. Yeah. James, I think you're going to really enjoy this because the customizability of it all and the way that they present it as well, because they'll show you the pitch and kind of in like um, in sections, it'll show you in highlighted in green where your player, depending on the role you want them to perform, will be at on the pitch. That's why I'm saying it feels so customizable because you can see it visually too. Like, okay, this is how my squad is going to be acting in the attack with the ball or without the ball. So how interesting, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of these like plus pluses, like obviously there's like a question of how they're going to interact with specific attributes, but I guess you could see a case where if you needed a specific type of player, you're better off using just like a silver card maybe even than like a gold that mm. would be out of the role? Potentially, if somebody doesn't have the role that you want them to perform, yeah, they're not going to perform it very well. That was how it was explained to us by the people who created this. They were like, if you have Jude Bellingham as a right wing, he doesn't have that position on his card. So he's not going to be able to perform those roles very well at all. It's kind of like how when you put a player on your team, you know, and they're on no chemistry, they're in the wrong position, there's that little exclamation mark, yellow caution symbol. There's something like that in the tactics mm. as well. It tells you like, hey, your guy's not in one of his positions, so he's not going to perform. The AI is not going to perform his job here very well. So, mm. But also I would say attacking positioning and defensive awareness still both exist and will have a, yeah. an impact on this. So it isn't like you know you can put a silver player in and they're suddenly because they have like really good role familiarity as it's called you know a poacher plus plus or something that they're going to be incredibly well positioned for a poacher necessarily like they're not going to play to that level are were there defensive roles too no the, there isn't really so every but every player will perform 
uniquely fine defensively, assuming they're in the appropriate position relative to like their attributes. Yeah, assuming that the defensive awareness is the same, I suppose, because mm. that is a significant factor. But the point is, though, the roles dictate how well and how intensely they trap back and things like that. So what happens if you change formations in game? Like Zinchenko has this like plus plus inside fullback role. Yep. And all of a sudden you change to a tactic that you want like overlapping fullbacks. Does he keep his ability based on what like the original tactic was or does he become brain dead? No. I mean, he won't be brain dead because he's a fullback by default. He'll be all right, but he won't be plus plus levels. Cool. So he'll still play okay, but he won't be on that level. But if you put someone who's like a center back there, even if they have good stats and they don't have that position, then they will positionally be pretty awful. And it was so noticeable, really obvious. Whereas like if you have a player with plus plus, uh, like there's an inside forward plus plus. And I think Dembele maybe has that. And he was literally like drifting across the whole pitch to find a good position just behind the front line. So it's just really, really obvious compared to how it was before when you set an instruction, whether it's working or not, which is nice. But yeah, all these things do have drawbacks defensively a lot of the time, not just because I guess they're going to be in a higher position, but also because they just won't defend as intensely if they're really attacking role. So I think that's just worth bearing in mind. There is kind of a counter to the kind of crazy attacking tactics you can create. But yeah, it's exciting. I think as Nate's saying, we'll have a lot of fun playing around with it. I'm sure there'll be some teething problems and it's it's a big thing for EA to change. They haven't changed it for so long. Yeah. Uh, So it'll be interesting. Uh, kind of to see what happens. Um, I guess there's some other stuff around smart tactics, they're calling it. So you can make in-game tactics changes uh, much more intuitively than you can make them now. You can switch between tactics, like how currently you can change between sort of defensive, attacking, ultra-attacking, etc. But they'll just be what you've called the tactic, I think, when you switch between them, which is a bit simpler. Uh, there's also tactical focus. You can switch to defend or attack. And I think what it does is kind of change your roles to make them more attacking and more defensive, basically, uh, just to give you a slight change uh, rather than a full on change to a different tactic. Uh, there are quick tactics like, you know, your team press, offside trap, etc. That's fairly obvious. There's an improved substitution system. There are tactical suggestions and that stuff can actually be done at any time. You know how currently you can't use the D-pad at certain times. You can just do it whenever, which is really helpful. In terms of some extra things, I guess, which are maybe good to know, there's plenty more, I'm sure, but these are just the things that uh, I've picked up. Revamped visualizations, so you can see sort of the shape of your team as you attack and what that would look like in the tactics menus. Uh, Nate already mentioned that you can kind of see the area the players are covering too in attacking sense and there's also saveable tactics presets uh, that aren't just saved to your squad so they're more kind of global across the game and also there's a thing called assignments which is basically what was called player roles oh yeah you can actually assign players to the back and front post for example on corner oh, kicks, oh, 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 uh, yeah, which is, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> that's pretty fun and then also you can now get a shareable code from tactics, which you can give to someone else, they can input the code, and they'll get your tactics, Ooh. roles, everything. Yeah, that's great cool. in there. Um, so RIP the tactic bank. Well, actually, it'll now be a code bank, I guess. So, <laughs> And it looks like you can paste those into the uh, web app and companion app as well, which is nice because obviously it's easier to copy and paste stuff on uh, mobile or on desktop than it is in the game. Um, yeah, anything else to add on that, Nate, before we move on? Yeah, I think that the code part is a really nice touch because especially with, I think a lot of people when they see this new edition of the FCIQ, it's going to look overwhelming just because it's new, it's different. There's a lot of toggle options and a lot of different roles and focuses that you can put on a player across the whole pitch. So I think it's going to seem confusing at first because there's so much customizability. And I think that those codes will be obviously a lot of the, oh, what's the meta? And oh, this is, this guy's meta is really sick. So I'm going to just copy his code and try it out. It just makes it a whole lot more um, efficient if you want to try a new tactic setup. You don't have to go in and switch it all yourself. You just paste the code, watch a tactic video or see somebody's tweet about it and they have their code in there. And you're just like, all right, let me try it plug it in mm. and you can read through how it works and play it out. And it just, it takes it um, some of the headache out of setting up your tactics. Yeah. And what I find really interesting is that it does, but are they going to have the same familiarity players as you? 
they might be using a player in that tactic who has poacher plus plus or inside forward plus plus, and that's really making it work for them. Whereas you might right. not have those players, right? So yeah, I think that, that although it's going to make it easier for people to basically copy tactics and just put them straight in, actually, you're probably going to be more punished than ever for doing that. <laughs> that <laughs> totally. So that would be really interesting. That's great. You kind of have to decide. You should be. Do you, Use your brain a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to decide, like, do you want to play a certain way because you want your team to play that way? Or do you want to play a certain way because it fits your players? So either you have to fit your tactics to your players or you fit the way you want to play and find players to fit that style. Totally. And it, actually, I think it's going to make it interesting in terms of the transfer market because I think it puts more emphasis on you choosing what players go in your squad versus doing gambles and you know getting a good player and just putting them in mm-hmm. because you want probably in some nah, let's tactics come on let's made. be real uh, no, okay, no, yeah, no, yeah, no 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 you're probably no, right no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> realistically you're just doing that gamble spc and then you're changing your tactics to fit the player aren't you yeah let's, let's, yeah let's be honest, <laughs> like yeah. oh i attack ronaldinho i'm not going to be lo- i don't know what his role is going to be so process <laughs> but like oh no i'm not going to use an inside forward because you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, yeah. You, you're right, but then also, I guess, for the sort of more fringe players, I suppose, around your squad, there may be more emphasis on picking the right player, uh, whereas there wasn't previously. But yeah, we'll have to find out. Right, I think that is pretty much it in terms of IQ, and it's interesting because I think any changes to managers? Oh yes, actually, there is a change to managers, but it's not particularly big. So basically, you can when you add a manager to your squad apply that manager's tactics to your squad sort of by default so you know if you put pep on it will say do you want to use this manager's tactics you press yes and it will set it up so it's sort of ticky tacker or whatever pep's particular style of play currently is and there isn't really any other benefit to managers apart from that they've not like buffed them or changed the way they work but you are going to be able to apply those tactics quickly and easily i don't suppose that'll probably affect people listening to this podcast that much they'll choose their own tactics but they have made that change i think we should move on to other gameplay changes there'll be more to come i'm sure because what we've seen is really a summary of what's coming and our own hands-on experience and a limited experience at that and there are some sort of bigger more overarching things around visuals also around player turning and animations you can't break dribbling animations in the same way you used to be able to using quick movements. And there's also some revamping of passing accuracy. All this kind of stuff is going to come out in, I'm sure, a proper gameplay pitch note, which we haven't seen at the moment. So we can come back to that once we have more detail. One of the things that did stand out, though, is that you're going to be able to professional foul. Yeah. So you can uh, hold the right bumper slash R1 and press A slash X, depending on your console, and uh, you'll take someone out. And then the final thing that I think is of note, and we'll, uh, as I said, come back to the other stuff another time, is goalkeeper play styles. We're finally getting proper goalkeeper play styles, which is exciting. And I'll just run through what they are. So we've got footwork, uh, dynamic and nimble a goalkeeper with the footwork. Play style excels at getting a foot on low hard shots before they can sneak past. We've got rush out. These keepers love to play on the front foot, rushing out to take attackers on in one-on-one situations. Deflector, the deflector doesn't just know where the ball is, they know where everyone is. Using that knowledge, they push the ball away from dangerous areas. Cross claimer, why wait for a cross to come to you when you can go to it? Cross claimers love mucking it up, punching balls away before they can become a danger. Far throw, risk a deflection off a drop kick. Nah, I'm just going to throw this ball 50 yards and really get that counterattack started. Far reach, there are keepers who stretch for the ball and then there are those who reach with everything they have, turning surefire goals into highlight reel saves. So actually the symbols I think will be kind of familiar to people because they have existed but just not as proper play styles in Ultimate Team. They will presumably have plus versions. From what I understand, the gameplay team have been working to make these balanced and also improve them and and make them actually do stuff that is useful. Um, So that's good. I guess it just makes a lot of sense. And I I don't know if there's anything really to add on them, but feel free to chime in. I feel like goalkeeper play styles haven't mattered as much this year. Like all the goalies at the end game now have all of the regular, Mm. which there's four of them in FC24. Um, But I don't think we pay attention to them too much. So I guess the biggest change would be if they come in as play style pluses, which 
I think is the hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That that should be the case. So yeah, always uh, concerns whenever goalkeepers have something new happen to them. But yeah, fingers crossed. So there we go. Uh, as I said, we'll be talking more about this because we'll get more information. There'll be pitch notes, things like that. If anyone has any thoughts on what we have heard so far, then please do get in touch. We'd be really interested to hear from you. You can do that at Foot Weekly Pod on Twitter, footweekly at mail.com, in the Pod Priority Questions channel, in the Supporter Discord for Gold or Above supporters. And uh, yeah, you can even, I guess, get in contact with our guests here, such as Nate, the Foot Accountant. Nate, it's been good to have you on. Any particular highlights for you so far? I think I'm the most excited for the FC IQ, just mm. because I think it's going to completely change how we play the game because it's giving you so much more control. Um, and if you don't want a lot of control, then you can go the simple route with like the smart tactic. But I think that's going to be really revolutionizing how we see the game and play it, making it more like a real match of football uh, of course rush is really really fun so i hope that mm. they integrate the events really good into that and moderate the rewards well so that it's a mixture of still a lot of fun and not just i have to play this and it has to be sweaty you know because i need the rewards type of thing so of course all the small quality of life things like the dupe storage and stuff like that too is is really great and there's probably more of that that we haven't even figured out yet since this is just like the first, you know, release of info. But yeah, it's a lot of the small things mixed with a bunch of big changes too. It's, it is exciting. I'll be honest. Yeah, I agree. I think the tactics revamp is not only exciting, but long overdue. I mean, the tactic system is pretty archaic now. And I would say, though, for me, Rush is probably the most exciting element just because it adds a whole new dimension to the game. I've been wanting a pro clubs like mode within ultimate team for years and years people have probably have heard me talk about it whenever the idea of new features in ultimate team comes up so it's something that I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into i think it will open up that kind of cooperative play to a lot of people for the first time and as long as you're mic'd up you're playing with people you know they'll really enjoy it and find it is a different beast to the rest of ultimate team and that it's a nice sort of respite i suppose and uh, in many ways, potentially more enjoyable than playing just one versus one. Uh, we'll talk more about the things that are coming, in-depth discussion, drawbacks and concerns we have potentially on future episodes. But for now, Japes, uh, how are we feeling about what we've had? No, oh, I mean, I'm I'm excited. Like a new tactical changes sounds super fun to me. Like I love tactics, mm. so <sighs> I'm I'm hopeful that they're like friendly, but also do what they say they're going to do. If that makes sense. Mm. Because it's like if they're too restrictive, I'm worried for the start of the game. Mm. Uh, just because yeah. I don't think there's going to be the player pool necessary to make the most of them. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you very much, first of all, to Nate for joining us. It's been good to have you on as always. Thank you, Ben. It's been fun as always. And uh, I'm excited to see EA put out some more, especially like graphics about this, um, mm. sharing, you know, some of those videos or pictures in a pitch notes. And as we get closer to the game, just learning more about it and how it's going to be implemented, I think that'll really help us understand it all too. Yeah, definitely. And finally to James, it's been great to have you along as always. It was fun. Indeed. It's been great. Thank you. And of course, thank you to all you listeners out there listening in. If you'd like to subscribe to the pod, then you can do so via the various different podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from. And you can also catch it on YouTube. If you're listening there, drop a like, leave a comment. It definitely helps out. And of course, subscribe. And if you would like an extra podcast every single week, then you can become a supporter. It's just three pounds a month. And as I said, you get double the podcast content. Just search support for weekly. And a big thank you to all those supporters for supporting the pod and keeping it going, including those icon patrons. Dave B, Hugh J, Darren W, Alistair M, Dom P, Rob P, Jeff B, Damon H, Tom B, Adam G, Neil P, Alex M, Jake S, Dan W, Roger D, Lee A, Andrew C, Nishant, Waterman, Dylan H, Adam R, Rob L, Brendan W, Michael K, David G, Jimmy K, Cherry Drank, John D, Michael B, Aditya S, and Joshua K. Plus a special thanks to Luke M, Dave B, Hugh J, Tom M, Darren W, and Pato Foot for advice and production assistance. 
Before I leave you, just one more thing to add though. Ultimate Team is a bit like life really. It has its many ups and downs. If you're having a few more downs than ups in real life in these more difficult times, then please don't feel that you're alone or need to struggle on without taking action. If you go to thecalmzone.net, there's loads of resources, advice, support, or even just a friendly chat for anyone who needs it. If it sounds like it could help you, then head over to thecalmzone.net. And for now, have a good one, and I'll catch you on the next podcast.